Is it here? It's here. This is it. It's the post what's his birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. to stay out of that picture. <laughs> She's got a couple things she wants to show you here. Testing one, two, three. This is a test for closed captioning. Today is Monday, May the 15th.
Herding cats or herding mares? Uh, same thing. <laughs> Laid plans. <laughs> Waiting for you? Yeah, yeah. Do you think that uh, we had to count on? I don't think that's the key. Good evening. We would like to call <coughs> the Durham City Council meeting to order on Monday the 15th and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. As you probably noted, we had a, a very special occasion earlier and we're going to follow through for the rest of the meeting. Uh, this is a very signal event. Uh, it's an occasion where we've had the opportunity to have all of the former living mayors in the city of Durham. And uh, I want to congratulate Councilman Eddie Davis, uh, whose idea it was to bring all this together. Eddie's sort of the historian of this, this council, and he's the birthday keeper of all our birthdays. He remembers all these good things. So uh, just, just a very special guy. So I'm, I'm going to first ask for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And then we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to recognize Councilman <coughs> Davis on that occasion. Uh, yes, Mayor Bell. Uh, we are honored to have the Cub Scout pack from St. Joseph's AME Church, uh, pack 137, and they're going to lead us in the pledge. Will everybody please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance? And if you're in uniform, salute. Otherwise, put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tim Cole McFadden. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, I'm not going to turn it over to Councilmember Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> We'd like to ask former Mayor. Robert Wentz Grabarik to come and join me. Mr. 
can stand right here. <coughs> I have a proclamation and I want to read it. Whereas Robert Wenzel Wentz Grabaric was elected by Durham voters on Saturday, May 18, 1963, and served as mayor until May 17, 1971, and whereas on the very same day he was elected, mass demonstrations advocating for the end of racial segregation at restaurants, movie theaters, hotels, and other public accommodations occurred in Durham. These demonstrations led to the arrest of hundreds of black citizens during rallies at numerous local restaurants, at City Hall, and at the county courthouse. And whereas on Sunday, May 19, 1963, the black demonstrators continued their quest for equality and were met by a set of white counter demonstrators. Not wanting to see Durham join the, the, those areas that had experienced violence and bloodshed, Mayor-elect Grabaric went to the site of the demonstrations and confirmed, conferred with black leaders Floyd McKissick and Hugh Thompson. And whereas through consultation and negotiations with at Attorney McKissick, Attorney Thompson, Mrs. Bessie McLaurin, Police Chief W.W. W. Pleasance and others, arrangements were made to provide food and cigarettes for the arrested demonstrators. At that point, dialogue began for the initiation of biracial meetings to discuss a resolution to the concerns of the demonstrators. And whereas on Monday, May 20th, 1963, Wentz Grabaric took the oath of office and officially became the mayor of Durham. Two days later, on May 22nd, 1963, the new mayor announced the appointment of a biracial group called Durham's Interim Committee. And whereas the work of the Interim Committee began immediately, the civil rights rallies and demonstrations continued. Without an invitation, Mayor Grabaric attended a joint meeting of the NAACP, the Durham Committee on Negro Affairs, and other groups at St. Joseph's AME Church on May 23, 1963. Mayor Grabaric rose and spoke to the mass gathering on that evening and asked that the demonstrations be suspended while the work of the Durham Inner Committee progressed. The mayor received an agreement to his proposal and a standing ovation from the audience. Whereas a CBS film crew was covering civil rights activities across the South and included this rally at St. Joseph's Church. This crew captured the mayor's remarks and the audience's reaction. On the next day, May 24, 1963, that footage from the rally appeared on the national broadcast of Eyewitness to History with Charles Collingwood. The commentary portion of the program contrasted Durham's approach, the co cooperation of the races, and the leadership of Mayor Grabaric to other civil rights approaches that were taking, places, pl taking place in other portions of America. And whereas on June the 4th, 1963, after meeting for 11 days, the Durham Interim Committee held a live local television press conference to offer its report to the City Council and the Durham community. In summary, the report stated the following, and I quote, Durham, North Carolina is pleased to announce that in a completely voluntary action of all hotel and motel operators, and a substantial number of food service operators on this date authorized the Durham Interim Committee to announce that they will serve their customers without regard to race. In addition, the leading businesses in Durham have agreed to employ citizens without regard to race. All tax supported units of government will similarly make all facilities and services available without regard to race. And whereas upon the request of the White House, a copy of the Durham Interim Committee report was sent by Western Union Telegram to President John Fitzgerald Kennedy via his assistant, Mr. Henry Hall Wilson. And whereas Durham's fortnight of fortitude 
in late May and early June of 1963 came before the March on Washington in August of 1963 and in advance of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. However, Mayor Gerbarek's four two-year terms should not be remembered only for his civil rights work. It also should be remembered for the annexation and development of Crowsdale, the annexation of Hope Valley, the rezoning and development of South Square Mall, the, locate, the relocation of the Ligon and Myers Company headquarters from New York City to Durham, the development and recruitment of several international and national firms to the Research Triangle Park, Durham's recognition by the Department of Civil Defense as the national leader in supplied shelters for all people during the Cold War era, the establishment of Operation Breakthrough after conferences with Vice President Hubert Humphrey and National Poverty Director Sergeant Shriver, the establishment of a sister cities arrangement with Durham, England, the designation of Duke Homestead as a North Carolina historic site, the negotiations with Durham banks to increase the interest rate paid interest rates paid to the city of Durham for its deposited funds, and the little known standoff against the National White Citizens Council in response to Durham's policies on racial inclusion. And whereas Mayor Graberic has often stated that, and I quote, we strive to encourage that this day and every day in Durham's history will allow our diverse togetherness to give light to our collective soul. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim Sunday, May 21st, 2017, as Robert Winsel Wentz Grabaric Day in Durham, and call upon our residents and visitors to join the City Council in celebrating the 98th birthday of the, our illustrious former mayor. The 98th birthday. <laughs> and finally, there's the last portion that says, witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina on this 15th day of May 2017, and it's signed by another illustrious mayor, <laughs> William V. Bill Bell, mayor of Durham. <laughs> this proclamation is yours. We'd like to have a few words from you. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Thank you, all the other councilmen, for putting together with this rather uh, bountiful proclamation. <laughs> I thank you most sincerely. In all of our lives, there'll be a moment, maybe two, that stand out specially. It goes with us and accompanies us to our eternity. I want to assure you tonight that this is my moment. Thank you so very, very much. But let me just say a word or two here, Ed, if I may. Uh, I came to Durham in uh, 1942. The Army brought me to Camp Butner in Durham, North Carolina. When the city of Durham gave me my precious bride, Marion Pritchard Norris, it was already more, much more, that I could ever repay. Tonight, tonight you put me deeper in your debt, but I'm grateful for it. Thank you so very, very much. There was a lot said. It. <laughs> Nick, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> <laughs> When Ed read the proclamation, there was a lot said, a lot was done. I would be terribly remiss and unfair 
to the many, many people, both white and black races, who helped in the area of civil rights insofar as Durham is concerned. I'm gonna cite one example because I think it points up that actually we're all better than we are and if we visit our conscience, we usually right up, wind up at the right place. About a month before the demonstrations started, and they were planned incidentally for about 30 days, and I told the group at St. Joe's at that time that uh, you have a perfect right to demonstrate. On the other hand, I know your plight fully and understand it completely. Two demonstrations, three more, 10 more, 30 more days won't change my mind one bit. Please, as first class citizens, honor my request to let me see if I can locate the conscience of my community. And that's what set up the committee that Ed mentioned. But there was one example when I formed that committee, the interim committee. There was one gentleman in town who I knew had to be on it. He was Harvey Rape. Everyone loved Harvey. He ran a very successful cafeteria on Main Street. He was a very fine man, a religious man, and genuinely believed that segregation was correct. To the point where one day he took a rifle, cradled it in his arms, came to the threshold of his restaurant, and dared a black patron to come in. Fortunately, no one did. And yet I knew that on the committee I was forming to discuss as to whether we could resolve and reconcile the differences in our community, I had to have his voice. I spent about two hours with him. He said, I'll call you tonight. 11.15 that night, I had given up. He called and Harvey Rape said, this is the ultra, ultra segregationist. My shirt is wet with my tears. I have just come in from the woods. Mr. Mayor, I will serve. What a beautiful moment in Durham's history. And he was one of the leading efforts to integrate our Russia. But it points up that in all our challenges that Durham has, say, in the future, Let's put our conscience to work. We all have one. And think it through. And we don't need demonstrations and riots and bombing and killings. Let's do it at the table. That's my sincere hope. Now, to today's world, in 1963, uh, and let me say this too because in reference to the committee, um, I did, when I was elected, what I thought I possibly could to improve all levels of our life in the city of Durham. And I felt that uh, every time I had the opportunity, I had to really seize it. And that's what you need to do, seize the opportunity. But rather, I look at it more really as a privilege as a privilege to serve the wonderful people of the city of Durham. In 1963, our country was rampant with riot. Today, our country is seriously, critically divided. In Durham, we decided that our diverse togetherness gives light to our soul. I hope that will ever be so in the future. Let me say finally that my wife and I and my family love each and every one of you in Durham and extend our very best wishes to each and every one of you Always, thank you very much.
Mr. Mayor, if I may um, thank the, the members of the Grabaric family for being here, and we appreciate your presence. Uh, also, we'd like to recognize the presence of several other former mayors who are here. Some of you saw a photograph being taken of all of the living former mayors, but we'd like to recognize Mayor Sylvia Kirkhoff. We'd like to recognize Mayor Nick Tennyson. And we were joined earlier by Mayor Wibb Gully, who had to leave because his daughter's birthday party is being held today. I think we have in the audience some representatives from at least two other mayors. I believe that Mrs. Leola Jenkins is here, uh, the widow of former Mayor Chester Jenkins. And I believe we have several representatives of the Harry Rodenheiser family, if they would stand. Harry Rudin has a served two, um, not consecutive terms, uh, two different times, like Grover Cleveland, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the other thing I'd like to do is we recognize the St. Joseph's um, Boy Scouts, and I think it's important that St. Joseph's is here because Mayor Grobarek went into St. Joseph's when other people would not have. And we also have a Boy Scout troop here from Watts Street Baptist, which is Mayor uh, Grabaric's church himself. So they are here with us. <laughs> and finally, before I turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor, I know you want me to get out of the way. Uh, uh, I think that there are some representatives here of some of the people that Mayor Grabaric worked with and went and talked with as soon as they were arrested. There were several people some of the real heroes, along with Magro Barrick, were those people who put themselves on the line, got arrested for standing up for the rights that everyone should enjoy. So I'd like to know if there are other people here who are part of the civil rights movement here in Durham. If you are here, please stand. I know Cora Cole McFadden is one of them. There may be other people. Uh, uh, Leola was one of the people too. So thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Mayor Bell, for enduring and allowing this to happen. This is a wonderful occasion. I'm glad that we took this time to uh, honor Mayor Grabaric, and we're going to do more of that on Winch Grabaric Day this coming Sunday. Well, Ed, I, I want to again congratulate you for really being the person that pulled all this together. I certainly want to congratulate all that are here this evening. The only, oh, sure, Mayor Grabaric, sure. As you come forward, you, you, free to use the microphone. It doesn't? Okay. I, I, I told went to the Mayor Grabaric when we were standing down there, I said the only, th only thing that's missing was the carnation. <laughs> now, you are free to stay, but we understand if you need to leave, uh, feel free to do that. We won't feel offended by any stretch of the imagination. Probably some of us would leave if we didn't have to be here. But, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, yeah, Mr. Somebody's... Mayor, I just wanted to just note that uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Col uh, Cora Cole McFadden brought in a letter that had been put in a time capsule written from the mayor at that time to the mayor at this time, and the author of that letter is here. In the Mayor Grabaric and the receiver of that letter 50 years later is also here, and I just think that's tremendous. So. Thank you. Thank you.
Is Mr. Jesse Helicott here by any chance? Oh, right behind me. Okay, great. Uh, this proclamation recognizes uh, National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And it speaks to the fact that whereas every day 93 Americans are killed by gun violence and more than 200 have sustained non fatal firearms injuries over the last five years, and whereas Americans are 25 times more likely to be killed with guns than people in other developed countries, whereas protecting public safety and the communities they serve is mayor's highest responsibility, where support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from dangerous people, and whereas mayors and law enforcement officers know their communities best, are the most familiar with local criminal, acti criminal activity and how to address it, and are best positioned to understand how to keep their citizens safe, whereas on June the 2nd, 2017, would have been the 20th birthday of Hadia Pendleton, a teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade was tragically shot and killed just weeks later, and where is the help honor and the 93 Americans who live lives are cut short and the countless survivors who are injured by shooting every day, a national coalition of organizations has designated June the 2nd, 2017 as the third annual National Gun Violence Awareness Day, whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange they chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods. And orange is the color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone who can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June the 2nd to help raise awareness about gun violence, whereas by wearing orange on June the 2nd, Americans will raise awareness by, about gun violence and honor the lives and lost human potential of Americans stolen by gun violence. Whereas renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the State of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim June the 2nd, 2017, as National Gun Violence Awareness Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to support their local communities' efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. And witness my hand, the Corporate Civil State of Durham. North Carolina, this is the 15th day of May, and I'm going to present this to you for any comments that you might Oh, I got quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, and the Durham City Council for this proclamation today. It is so important to keep this issue front and center for the city of Durham, and we must stand with the families who have been directly impacted by gun violence. This pro proclamation serves as a call to action for citizens to get involved in finding a solution. If you want more information, you can find Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense online. I invite everyone in our city to wear orange on June 2nd, the color of gun violence prevention that celebrates the vitality of life. We will have several buildings glowing orange in Durham on June 2nd, including the Mutual Building and the Carolina Theater and DPAC. And again, thank you to the mayor and the city council and everyone here tonight. This proclamation recognizes uh, National Public Works Week, and I've asked Marvin Williams, our Director of Public Works, to join me. Uh, it speaks to the fact that public works services provided in our community are an integral part of, all every, of citizens' everyday lives, whereas the support of understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection. Whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depend on these facilities and services, whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction, is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public work officials, whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel <coughs> who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitudes and understanding of the importance of the work they perform, 
Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st and May 27th, 2017, as National Public Works Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, and comfort and quality of life. And with my hand, Corporal Seal, the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the, this is the right proclamation. 15th day of May, 2017. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bell, member, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Uh, there's several members from the Public Works Department. I think it would be great to recognize them for National Public Works Week here tonight. So if they would all stand so that they could be formally recognized tonight. So it's great to get that recognition because public works is one of those fields where you normally don't know about us unless we're doing something wrong. So it's good. <laughs> it's really good to actually have the staff recognized for a positive thing. So next week is National Public Works Week officially. We'll have several activities as we do every year. Monday we'll have our display in the lobby for the public to see and any city employees to get an idea of what public works is. Um, on Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. at our maintenance operations center, on MLK, we'll be having an internal mini public works type college just to give employees an idea of what public works is. And then also on Friday at Southern Boundaries, Boundaries Park, next to the operations center at 11 a.m., we'll have our annual lunch. All members of council, the administration are welcome to join us. Lunch will be served at 1130. So please feel free to stop by, uh, talk with the employees, and thank you for recognizing all the work that the staff does within public works every day. Thank you. Let me ask, are there any comments by members of the council? Yes, Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, could we just pause in silent meditation? Uh, we lost Chuck Dave, Baba Chuck Davis, and uh, his loss is um, a difficult one for all of us. And I would like to propose that uh, we move forward with the resolution. Um, and when we present it, to present it in the style that Baba Chuck would like it, with his African American ensemble here in City Hall. Thank you. The other piece, Mr. Mayor, is that I, I worked with every mayor that was here, <laughs> with the exception of the one who would be 98 years old. And I learned something from each of them. Any other comments by members of the council? If not, uh, recognize the priority items first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Likewise, assistant city attorney. No priority items, Mr. Mayor. And c city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. First item then, the consent agenda. Uh, if persons want to pull an item, we'll pull that item and discuss it later in the meeting. Uh, I'll read each item heading. Uh, item one is approval of city council minutes. <coughs> item two is street and infrastructure acceptances. Item three is proposed FY18 planning department work program. Item 14 is amendment one to the local agreement with the county of Durham regarding homeless services and the homeless services advisory committee. Item five is the Durham computerized signal system. Item six is the Durham bike plus walk implementation plan. Item seven is adoption of FY1718 water and sewer rates. Item eight is the annual property casualty insurance plan for fiscal year 18, 2018. <clears throat> Item nine is professional services contract with the John R. McAdams Company incorporated for the Snow Hill Road Park Master Plan Project. Item 10 is the interlocal agreement for fire stations slash EMS facility in southeastern Durham County. 
Item 11 is the contract with Imagineit LLC for asset and space management software. Item 12 is a citywide classification and compensation study for non sworn persons. Item 13 is compensation plan recommendations. Item 14 is a contract with Eckert Youth Alternatives doing business as Eckert's kids to deliver services for the training to work reentry grant four. Item 15 is a sewer only utility extension agreement with Bracton Summers to serve 2643 Burton Road. Item 16 is a contract SW46D Hillendale Road Bike and Pedestrian Improvements, <coughs> tip number U4726HN. Item 17 is a governmental agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey for deployment, operation, and maintenance of rainfall and stream flow gauges at the City of Durham's Public Works Operations Center. Item 18 can be found on the general business agenda. Items 19 through 23, items that can be found on the general business agenda is public hearings. Item 25 is designation of John Hope Franklin Memorial Highway. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, they can be saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, turn it over to the city manager. This is a general business agenda for the proposed fiscal year 2017-2018 budget and fiscal year 2018-2023 capital improvement plan. Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, in light of the uh, incredible comments that were just made by Mayor Graberic, I uh, would remiss uh, because I know that any comments that are made by me the rest of this evening or anybody else for that matter have no chance of, uh, of being as, as relevant and pertinent to this community not only from a historical perspective, but uh, for our future. Uh, I'm going to ask for a pass on making the presentation tonight. I don't think I'm going to get it, but I'm going to at least ask for it in respect to, uh, to Mayor Gerberic. <laughs> All right, well, we'll go anyway. Good try. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden. Did you say okay? Oh. <laughs> Members of the city councils. Uh, Sitting in for City Attorney Baker, Ms. Herring. Uh, city Clerk Gray, City Staff, residents of Durham present here tonight or viewing on the Durham Television Network or on Facebook Live. I am honored to again be here before you this evening to present the proposed 2017-2018 fiscal year budget for the City of Durham. To continue our tradition of making the annual budget presentation relevant to current happenings in the city, you might recall that last month, Vogue magazine called Durham the hippest city in North Carolina. We just couldn't let that, com that go without comment, and what a better way to do that than with something as mundane as the annual city budget. The Vogue writer mainly focused on our great restaurants and other attractions that make Durham, as they called it, so hip. A few days after the article appeared, a local columnist wrote that there was so much more that goes into making Durham hip, and it's something that we've known for a long time. And he urged Durham residents to keep it quiet. As he correctly acknowledged the fact that Durham is hip is nothing new. We've often described ourselves as funky, authentic, cool, and now hip. But to be fair, no one has ever accused government of being hip. Well, that might be debatable. A few weeks ago, a citywide spring cleanup unearthed some decades-old photos of what I'd describe as a few hip-looking city employees whose jobs were to do what some might call square work, protecting Durham residents, safeguarding tax dollars, maintaining city vehicles and property, and in general, running the city. Now, in my younger days, there were many things that I thought were hip. Extended mustaches, <laughs> flare leg pants, double knit suits, a dark suntan, and eating, out, uh, eating late night takeout. But now I know better. And in the words of the prolific singer Huey Lewis, I'm working out most every day, watching what I eat. They tell me that it's good for me, but I don't even care. I know it's crazy, I know it's nowhere, 
but there's no denying that, especially as we get older, it just might be hip to be square. The 2018 budget continues and builds on the city's everyday square efforts to responsibly meet residents' basic needs while at the same time introducing creative and innovative or hip ways to address community challenges. In developing the budget, the administration continues to be guided by the city's strategic plan as well as encouraging and actively seeking community input. This year, in addition to the various ways the city has traditionally reached out to the community, We've also taken into account the priorities identified in the 2016 Resident Satisfaction Survey, which results can be viewed on the city's website. As always, I want to thank you, Mayor Bell, and the City Council for your guidance and participation throughout this budget process. From the construction cranes downtown to the residential building boom happening all over town, it's obvious that the secret's out on many of the factors that went into Vogue's assessment of why Durham is hip and indicates how Durham's economy is faring. Maybe not so visible are the people working to make their neighborhoods even better places to live. This year's proposed budget helps to sustain this progress and implements and funds new and innovative ways to address many of our community's most challenging issues. And I'll hi highlight a few of the, the key components of my recommended budget this evening. The proposed total budget for fiscal year 2017-18 is $429.4 million, which is a 6.1% increase from last year. The proposed general fund budget, which covers the city's core services, is $189.4 million, a nearly 5% increase from last year. This year, to meet the city's need to cover expanding priorities, particularly in affordable housing and public safety, I am recommending a 1.79 cent property tax increase per $100 of assessed value, bringing the city's total tax rate to 57.86 cents. Values for new construction and annexation will push the value of a penny on the tax rate to $2.79 million. What this means for the average homeowner is a city tax bill of about $1,041 per year or $86.75 per month on a house valued at the median house value of $180,000, which is $32 more than last year or less than $3 more per month. Proposed general fund expenditures include increases for personnel costs and significant increases in transfers for more street resurfacing, while operating expenditures have decreased by a little more than 7% as a result of a variety of operational savings and prior year one-time expenditures. The proposed budget uses a little more than $6 million of fund balance for a variety of one-time costs. The projected fund balance at the end of the fiscal year is $49.9 million, which is 27.6%, and helps safeguard the city against economic uncertainty and emergencies in the future. The city continues to enjoy an outstanding credit rating by all of the rating agencies due in part to sound fiscal management and our percentage of fund balance. This year, I propose using fund balance to address some of the concerns that we've heard from residents. $2.6 million is provided for additional street resurfacing above the $4 million included in the recur recurring paving expenditures budget and $900,000 on top of the $800,000 in recurring funding for deferred maintenance needs. Both of these were top priorities raised in the 2016 Resident Satisfaction Survey. Also, to encourage police officers to reside in the city and become part of neighborhoods, nearly $1.7 million is being allotted for the second year phase-in of the take-home vehicle program. I continue to enjoy leading the city's nearly 2,400 employees and firmly support keeping, rewarding, and retaining them high on the city's priority list. The proposed budget continues the pay for performance plan and reflects the full implementation of the public safety employees pay plans. Within the pay for performance plan, an average of 4% is budgeted for general employees, while 5% is budgeted for sworn personnel in line with the pay plan adjustments that were approved earlier this year. 
While health care costs continue to rise, again this year some premium increases are necessary to maintain the financial strength of the city's self-insured fund that covers the lives of more than 6,000 employees and their dependents. Participation in the Blue Local Plan has risen 7.5 percent this year thanks to special efforts to inform employees about more cost-effective health care options. This year, the budget proposes to add 53 positions, including 30 new firefighters to staff the soon-to-be-completed Fire Station 17 in Southeast Durham. The budget also includes the conversion of a significant number of temporary and part-time positions to full-time permanent status, along with a limited number of new specialized positions to address such issues as cyber and building security. Keeping the community safe continues to be a top priority and continues to be reflected in the city's budget. Chief C.J. Davis is nearing her first anniversary leading the police department, and she and her command staff and officers continue to work to build and enhance relationships in the community. Funding is included in this budget to replace and upgrade electronic equipment, support programs including body-worn cameras, and to continue recruitment and retention programs that are underway. Funding is also included to replace mobile data computers and in-car cameras, as well as hiring a new crime analyst. Maribel frequently says strong neighborhoods make even stronger communities. Over the last year, we've seen how engaged residents contribute to making neighborhoods better. Some examples of these efforts include the Transformation in 10 initiative, neighborhood mini-grants, such as the one shown here at Southside, and City Hall on the go. I'd also like to highlight here are some of the improvements to our neighborhood parks made possible by the dedicated half cent for parks, which will continue in the proposed budget. If you haven't visited them lately, you'll find a noticeable improvement in ball fields, parking lots, and even restrooms. Major upgrades to other parks and recreation facilities will continue this year and will be funded in the capital improvement plan. At the direction and support of City Council, I am pleased to include a special emphasis on more proactively engaging the city's youth in this year's budget. Beginning June 1, to encourage youth to better take advantage of recreational opportunities, all centers and activities, outdoor and indoor pools, and daily pass fees will be eliminated for Durham youth under 18 years of age. Additionally, new teen programs will begin September 1st at four recreation centers, including a drop-in program from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. immediately following school hours. DPR will also be hiring youth ambassadors to enhance marketing efforts to help inform teams, teens about these programs. The administration has heard the council and its call for better partnerships between the city and other agencies to work together and supportively for the good of the city's youth, youth now and in the future. Earlier uh, this year, the city was awarded a $1.2 million grant to be used over three years to address ju justice-involved youth employment beginning this summer. The goal is to improve their lives and job opportunities, lower violent crime rates, and reduce high levels of poverty in certain areas of the city. As Durham basks in everything that makes us hip, it no doubt makes the city very attractive to others seeking to be a part of it. While that's great for the city's economy, it also creates challenges for many of our lower income residents, many of whom who have lived here all their lives with issues of affordable rent and home prices. Last year, the city identified goals at, aimed at addressing the significant affordable housing, housing challenges for lower income households. While these goals provided a strategic path forward, they also highlighted the, highlighted the significant gap of available affordable housing. These gaps include the need for affordable home ownership, new affor affordable home ownership and rental units, preserving existing affordable rentals, enhancing collaboration with the Durham Housing Authority, and ensuring housing stabilization in appreciating neighborhoods. Addressing these priority gap areas of the city's affordable housing strategy all start and end with adequate funding. And that is why I'm recommending that this budget increase the dedicated housing fund by one penny, which combined with federal entitlements and the existing penny will bring the annual commitment to shelter and affordable housing to almost $9 million. I 
I will be requesting that the City Council set aside a significant amount of time during the upcoming budget work sessions to discuss the adequacy of the proposed level of funding and appropriate allocations of funds within each of the affordable housing priority areas. Once these levels are approved, staff will be positioned to solicit and fully vet proposals from housing partners to implement specific initiatives and projects. Another high priority identified in the recent resident satisfaction survey was traffic. As the city grows, accommodating travel in the city is top of mind for many residents. The city will continue to support core transit services and grant funds will pay for updated technology to more effectively manage traffic. While the city has enjoyed the support from Duke University over the last eight years for the Bull City Connector, Duke's funding will be reduced in half this year and will cease entirely in fiscal year 2019. The coming year's work will include an evaluation of all bus routes and headways, including the Bull City Connector. Once again this year, no transit fare increases are included in the proposed budget, making Go Durham one of the least expensive transit fares in major cities in North Carolina. The city is also further enhancing traffic management needs by adding staff to traffic system maintenance, such as pedestrian signal and signal upgrades and for fiber maintenance of these signals. As previously mentioned, the proposed budget will more than double funding for paving and street maintenance to $6.6 .6 million a year. Parking needs continue to be addressed with on-street parking meters introduced earlier this year. Now we continue to work through the issues, none, not, not, not unexpected, and other solutions are in the planning stages, including the construction of a new garage at, at Morgan and Mangum, adding new garage equipment and increasing monthly parking garage rates. The budget continues to support the arts and cultural programs throughout the city, including over $1.6 million in funding to support the Durham Arts Council, the Carolina Theater, and St. Joseph's Haytai Heritage Center. Last December, many of us celebrated the return of the Durham Holiday Parade, which was by all accounts a great success. <laughs> and funding is again included in this, uh, for this event. Funding is also included for the wonderful festivals that we've come to expect and appreciate, including the Art of Cool, Moogfest, Full Frame Documentary Film Festival, and the American Dance Festival. And finally, as we talk about arts, an increase from $20,000 to $75,000 for public art is included in the proposed budget. DPAC continues to also be an incredible success story, providing a significant economic impact and attracting thousands to our community without any property tax funded subsidies or support. Durham also took a big step forward in April with the grand opening of the Development Services Center. And thanks to the city county planning and inspections departments for leading this effort, which is streamlining the development review and permitting process for businesses as well as residents. And while I've mentioned a few capital improvement projects earlier, I'd like to call your attention to a few more listed here on the slides. Approximately $1.6 million for parks and recreation trails, centers and facilities, $2 million for public safety radio replacements, and $1.5 million for sidewalk repairs have been allocated in the proposed budget. Overall, the capital improvement budget includes $136.9 million for new and existing projects. So I've highlighted many of the key budget recommendations and I invite you to take a closer look at them over the next few weeks. There are many other projects and initiatives that might not be so hip, but are definitely necessary to contribute to keeping neighborhoods healthy and thriving, from meeting our infrastructure needs, to keeping our community and our environment clean. The staff looks forward to delving deeper into the details of the proposed budget at next week's budget work sessions. Developing the budget is always a collaborative process in Durham, relying on the groundwork of long-term financial and strategic plans developed over the last few years, and at the same time trying to predict what the future holds. And it's now time for the elected leadership and the residents to review and scrutinize the proposed budget. Residents are invited to share their thoughts at the next council meeting at a public hearing on Monday, June 5th. We remain committed to transparency in the budget as well as in the total operations. Copies of the proposed budget are now available on the city's website in the city clerk's office and in the, uh, the budget and management services department. 
And if you don't have time to review the entire budget document, I encourage everyone to at least re read the transmittal letter, which is an excellent summary of the budget proposal. I also want to encourage residents to engage with us on any of the platforms, social media platforms listed here. As always, I have special recognition goes to Bertha Johnson and her management and budget and management services team along with the department directors for their leadership to ensure that the strategic plan guides and aligns with budget priorities. And finally, as this is Mayor Bell's final budget presentation, I would like to offer my deepest appreciation to, for his guidance and leadership through 17 budget presentations, nine of which were from me, Mayor. And Mr. Mayor, you have set a great example by illustrating the value of listening and valuing the viewpoints of each person while acting for the good of the entire community. Thank you, Tom. And I will truly miss working with you. I also continue to value the close working relationship that I have had over the years with each member of the City Council. On a personal note, doing good and doing the right things for the community and for the benefit of future generations means more to me every day. Two years ago, I introduced you to my first granddaughter, Sable. And Karen and I welcomed our new granddaughter, Jordan, just a few weeks ago. <laughs> While unfortunately our two granddaughters do not live in Durham, they are a constant reminder to me that decisions we make today will impact generations in our community for a long time. I believe this budget supports the square as well as the hip city services that our residents come to know and love. And as a community, we must continue to work together to make Durham a place that is welcoming, supportive, and a place that everyone can call home. Thank you. Well, Tom, as you wait, make your way back to the, uh, we got some music. Is he go dance on coming up here? <laughs> You'll square out. <laughs> well, Tom, Tom, I want to again thank you and your staff for bringing uh, a balanced budget to us, uh, something for us to really begin to start the discussions with. Uh, it's apparent that you've listened carefully, your staff has listened carefully to some of the issues that have been raised and I think it's reflected in the budget. And as we go f further uh, to finalizing the budget, uh, uh, we still depend on the staff and certainly the public input that we receive as we try to craft a budget. Uh, this is not a public hearing, but it does for persons an opportunity who've been here who want to sign up to speak on a particular item uh, to make comments. And I'm going to recognize these persons, but before I do that, I don't know if any, any council members have anything they want to say before then. If not, uh, let me call these names and uh, each person has two minutes. Uh, one is, it just says Mina, M-I-N-A, is that person here? Okay. Uh, the next is Jose Romero, is that person here? And the last one is Nick Johnson, is that correct? Okay. So e each of you have two minutes if you proceed to the podium to the right, please. And again, could you just state your name and address? Address? Mina, Elementarum. You have an address? Uh, yes, 27707 is my zip code. All right. Okay, um, thank you so much for the presentation on the fiscal like budget for this year. I'm here to speak about the public safety budget. Last year, over, se uh, 
almost 70% of that budget went to the police department, um, and that did not include the $70 million that was allocated for a new police headquarters. Um, as a resident of Durham, I believe this is way too much money to go to policing when we know there are more effective and more community accountable ways to ensure public safety, which include unarmed crisis response workers and mental health care, and using restorative justice meth methods to mediate conflict. Um, also, the current police department acts with little accountability to the residents of Durham. Durham uh, the Durham Police Department has killed two residents this year within a less than a six month period with no repercussions. Um, Speaking to some of the residents who live just across the street from the new headquarters and are the most affected by the issue of policing um, in Durham, we asked them how they would have spent that $70 million and went to the police headquarters. $70 million is enough money to give each person in Durham $300 each. Um, a few of their answers was they would use it to pay their rent, they would use it to pay off loans. We spoke to some children about what they thought they could do with that money, and um, one little girl said she would buy a hair shop because she wants to be a hairdresser. And so those are just some of the ideas that Durham residents have about what public safety looks like to them and what they want to see that money spent on. Uh, Jose Romero. Oh. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, City Council. My name is Jose Romero. Um, my, I, my address is 1207 Watts Street uh, here in Durham. Uh, hello, City Council and fellow Durhamites. I, I'm here speaking quickly um, as a representative of Durham Beyond Policing to share, as Mina did, um, some letters from the community members that live across the street from the new police headquarters who are not consulted in the process of choosing a location for that police headquarters. So we want to make sure that their voice is present in where the police budget goes since it wasn't present in the designation of the new headquarters. So uh, quickly, um, one uh, male member from the Liberty Street Department said that he needed help with rent. Um, being able to use some of that funding money um, to help uh, the housing gap that was identified earlier in the budget discussion is one of those elements that we think should really be emphasized in the budget proceedings moving forward. Um, secondly, um, a female resident from Liberty Street Apartments indicated that they would like support for the underfunded classrooms that our students need to develop and to learn. Um, so we'll see, there we have it. We have education and housing are what the community members of Durham that um, directly are in the line of sight of the police officers are asking for. We believe this is fully within the power of the city council to actualize, and we will be continuing to share these voices with you all as the budget continues to be discussed. Um, so we want a Durham that is not only hip, um, not only square, but maybe a haven for the, com the various community members that live here. So thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Nick, Nick Johnson. Uh, good evening, Council, Mayor. Uh, my name is Nick Johnson. Uh, I live at 508 South Buchanan Boulevard. Um, I'm one of the owners of Ponysaurus Brewing Company, uh, the cookery and uh, dashi restaurant in downtown. Um, I don't believe that I can convince you with my two minutes to spend the $12 million that it would propose to uh, cost to get rid of the downtown loop, but I would just like to take a moment to focus your attention on the opportunity that we have as a city to pay attention to um, how we structure and plan for the future. Um, many years ago, we spent a large sum of money on the streetscapes in downtown, and as we are now seeing um, some of the fruits of that, I would encourage you to, um, to take into consideration perhaps not spending the 12 million right now that it would take to, um, to accomplish getting rid of the downtown loop, which basically chokes our downtown into a small island, but at least spend the money that it would take to do a detailed study um, there, there, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this, and I, I don't know uh, all of the details to share with you about this, but I have certainly read a bunch of them and would encourage you to get the experts in here that can share it with you. Um, Durham City and County owns tremendous amount of land um, encircling downtown, which could be used to offset some of the costs of um, restoring downtown to a, a more grid-like structure that it used to be, um, which would do a world of good for um, creating a walkable, connected, safe, and enjoyable downtown area. I think that without us um, taking an active role and, and, and seeking out um, a well thought out plan for what this city will become in the next 10 years, um, if we don't do that now, we will end up with a piecemeal 
um, this seems like a good idea at the time. We'll do a little bit now where we could create um, a vision of the future of downtown Durham, um, beginning with a, a modest expense this year in, in deciding how to go about doing that. Um, I'm here speaking um, for a handful of downtown business owners um, who I'm sure will, uh, you'll hear from them as well. But thank you for your time. <laughs> If, if there are no comments by members of the council, I'd entertain a motion to receive the manager's budget as presented. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move to the next item, which is uh, public hearing. Item 19, Urban Open Space Plan. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman from the City County Planning Department. Um, for your consideration tonight is the Urban Open Space Plan, which adopts strategies for the preser preservation and improvement of open space in the urban and central compact tiers. Uh, this draft open space plan categorizes the many different types and purposes of open space and provides recommendations to create and preserve open space areas through a variety of tools and resources. If approved by City Council, the Urban Open Space Plan would be adopted as an, amend as an element of the comprehensive plan. Staff recommends approval, as does the Planning Commission, which voted in favor by a vote of 12 to 1 at their February 14th meeting. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the Council. Okay, thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, we do have one person that has signed up to speak, but I would ask first are there comments, questions by members of the Council, recognize the Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Shul in that order. I know the um, Planning Commission suggested that you do some tweaking. Did you? Yeah, we did, we did treat, uh, tweak the wording, <laughs> tweak the wording uh, at, to, in response to the uh, commissioner's concerns that were raised at the planning commission hearing. So I think we've, we've addressed those. Okay, thank you. That's Councilman Shule. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, Scott and the planning staff, uh, terrific plan very clearly and effectively written. Um, and I really appreciate how you looked at the problem from so many different angles and started at a very high level and then drilled down to the neighborhood level and, and even to the very, very specific project. So congratulations on that. Um, I also really appreciated the environmental justice lens that you took and the emphasis on finding out which of our communities were underserved in terms of open space. And the, it was, I thought the methodology for that was really very interesting and compelling and appreciated that. So did you all, uh, so that's my first question. Did you all um, invent that methodology or did you find it somewhere? I wish I could say yes, but we, we stole that from our friends at the, the MPO who used that for their, yeah. mm -hmm. their environmental justice analyses. Yeah, it's great. The, um, on page 18, I uh, just have a few specific questions. Streams polluted by cooking-related waste, oil, grease, and food. That was one of the biggest pollutants in all of these streams. So how does that get into our streams? Cooking, oil, grease, and food. That's probably a better question for um, my colleagues in Public Works. Uh, we. We use their watershed uh, protection master plans to extract that information, so I don't know the exact details. Okay. Maybe you could send us an email about it at some point. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I couldn't understand how that happened. I believe it, but uh, it was just interesting to me to see that as a major pollutant. Uh, you know, it's like one of the major, only, major category in all of these. So on page 20, uh, what are some of the Keystone sites and the urban gems? I didn't see any of those named. I didn't quite understand what, like what that what what they might be. So those are uh, two things that are also found in uh, the watershed protection master plans that the Public Works prepared. So they are the Keystone sites are larger sites in the urban areas in in the watersheds where those have been prepared that are are vacant and could provide uh, water quality protection if they're acquired. And the urban, the urban gems are smaller ones that could be uh, acquired, but would have a less of, a, of an impact. So give me an example of a site. Uh, let's see. I, 
I think there's a there's some vacant properties down near the stream that goes just south of Central and Olson Avenue. Those were some of the ones that were identified in the uh, Third Fork Creek Master Plan. Mm -hmm. um, urban gems would be more like smaller, like a vacant lot that's adjacent to a stream. Okay. Uh, so I see. So they're all vacant lots, or they're they, all they vacant. Would be, pieces they would land. be vacant, or or a property that has a significant portion of it that's still vacant. Um, on page twenty four, uh, there's a reference to strategic plan goal five, and it notes that in that goal we target forty percent of our land to be uh, shaded by tree canopy. That's our target. I just want to uh, urge that we review that because we're currently we know from general services report a couple of months ago our tree canopy is currently at 52 percent um, and it seemed to me that we want to review that that number in the strategic goal we don't want to we don't want a goal that sets us significantly back in tree canopy so I just want to urge you and our city management to look at that that goal five uh, figure there um, Page 29, uh, I just want to note that there are 23 more miles of trails that are in our trails master plan just in the urban tier alone. Uh, and so what I want to say about that is we need to build those trails. Um, our, our, um, our residents want this. They always rank extremely high. and. Um, I just want to say to our my colleagues and the manager and our city administration that uh, this con should continue to be a priority for us. And I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, speed up the rate at which we're building trails. I feel very strongly that we need to. So I'm glad to see that we have some money set aside in the uh, CIP for uh, planning the five Alta trails, uh, but um, I just want to continue to urge us to speed that up. So I'm not asking for your response from you that, Scott, unless you want to. Uh, I don't have a response <laughs> to that. So noted. <laughs> so noted. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, on page 36, there's a quote beginning of future Durham. Let me try to find that, um, because I thought that was a, one of the most interesting uh, it was just a, such an interesting um, sentence. I'm trying to pull it up, Scott. If my computer will let me. Maybe you can find it. A future Durham, do you see it on page 36? Page 36 in the doc, in the uh, report. I'm about to I think I'm about to find it here. Just came up on my computer. Yeah. Thank you, Jillian. Mm -hmm. A future Durham will see more community gardens, more small lots with trees, the steady replacement of dying street trees throughout the city, increased tree canopy on public property such as parks, cemeteries, schools, and public facilities, as well as a program to plant trees on residential properties, initially targeting districts three and five where the canopy is most deficient. That is a great sentence uh, and, and, and a laudable goal. And uh, I just want to highlight that because it, it calls for doing many of the things that uh, we want to do. And I want to just, again, urge us to keep that in mind. That is, uh, those are things that I think are critically important to us. And I think funding those things uh, is is just very important and so I, again I want to mention that to the manager and to my colleagues um, on page 43 playground inspection legislation by the state is now an impediment to cooperation with our schools like Brogdon what is the can you talk about what the inspection legislation is that's an impediment to our cooperation with schools so it Again, I'm afraid to say that that would be something better answered by our colleagues in Parks and Recreation. They're, they raised that issue during the interdepartmental review um, since one of the, the key strategies to kind of leveraging our existing assets is to use schools as, as a recreate, 
for open space and recreation. Um, but there's, it has something to do with the fact that schools don't have to have the same inspections that um, city parks do, or something to that effect, so that the the school playgrounds aren't up to the same standards that our, our city playgrounds are. So um, I may not be getting that exactly right, but it has yeah. something something to that effect. Okay. Well, I have a couple reactions to that. One is we should know what that is, and we should see if there's a fix for it. Because I know that, that Parks and Rec has had a very um, conscious plan to try to be working more in terms of our playgrounds with the schools. And it makes all the sense in the world uh, because we have those playgrounds, we have those facilities, and we ought to be able to share them, especially at times when schools aren't in session, of course, the weekends and so forth. So, and then the other thing is the particular mention of Brogdon. So Brogdon is not a playground problem. You know, Brogdon is a, you know, so one of the sites that you all pulled out as an important site, potential site for one of the few neighborhoods, really, that doesn't have a park nearby. You, you, you mentioned Brogdon as a site where a green space where people could play, and it is. I, I coached soccer at Brogdon for a lot of years. So that's, there's no playground there that's a problem. So I just want to, I just would like to understand what it's going to take to get that cooperation, and I think and it's certainly important. I can get more details from Parks and Recreation, and we could probably use the uh, the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission as a, uh, an advocate for that. Thanks, and I know, again, I know Parks and Rec is really interested in this. Um, you mentioned on page 45, more cemetery open space amenities. What is a cemetery open space amenity? Well, I think the key thing we were getting at there is that cemeteries are, well, in some ways, they serve as kind of the, the open space and relief in areas that don't have parks necessarily. But they're also one of the, the assets the city owns where tree canopy could be in, increased relatively easily. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just, just looking at cemeteries as an open space, not all open space has to be actively used for recreation. I see. So the amenities might be simply tree planting. That's right. Or allowing them to be open so that people can walk through them, or things like that. Okay. Um, so I guess my last question is, is for you and for uh, staff in general, which is how we, they're, they're, you, you've got a kind of plan for, you have all these objectives and sub-objectives and there's a ton of them and, and they're awesome. I mean, I, I, I guess I need to say that again. This is, this report is tremendous. I just think that, that what it puts forward for us in terms of a vision for what this open space can be, the urban open space, and the specificity with which it attacks the problem. You know, you talk neighborhood by neighborhood, park by park. I mean, just all the improvements that you recommend are, are great. But I, my, my concern is how are we prioritizing these many objectives and sub-objectives and kind of, I guess what I'm interested in is this was an interdepartmental effort, so who owns the plan now and who's going to drive this now? And I don't know if that's a question for you or for the manager, but I'm just trying to find out. So here it is. It's awesome, but again, it's a very big interdepartmental effort. How will this be? Who will make sure it, it happens? Well, as an element of the comprehensive plan, the planning department, I guess, owns it. Um, I can say that the the members of the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission, particularly their Open Space Committee, have already started looking at all of those, and they're going to actively use this kind of, kind of like their own strategic plan for at least for the urban part of Durham, to uh, start highlighting uh, the the recommendations they think sh should be focused on first. There are some things that don't require the uh, spending money. Um, one, we can actively now. If a property is about to be or considered for surplus or something like that, we can review it based on this plan. And if it has high suitability for open space, the city can, or the county, who also has a lot, a lot of surplus land, can can hang on to that for open space purposes. Yeah. So, so each of the departments or each of the objectives had a department or somebody that was going to look after that. So. 
have those things kind of been assigned to those apartment departments at this point, or you know, how does that work? So the, we, when we did the interdepartmental review, we sent it to those departments uh, to make sure they at least had buy-in on what the recommendations were. Um, it'll be up to the advocacy role of the DOS to kind of pick the ones that they think are most important, and then we can work with those departments to, to implement those things. Okay. All right. Well, that's my concern. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying about DOS, but DOS is a volunteer group. And um, they're wonderful. They do a great job. But I do think that our departments are going to have to be paying a lot of attention to these recommendations. So, but again, I think you know I urge our residents and uh, to read this, or it's, it's it's pretty dense. Maybe not read all of it, but you know find your neighborhood and uh, see where your open space is and what the opportunities are, uh, because I do think that it it really is. You know, if we can do these things, this will be. You know, I, I believe we can do these things. This will be a tremendous, uh, tremendous achievement in terms of open space. So thank you. Thank you for a great report. Thank you, Councilman Shule. Are there other questions recognized? Uh, oh, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to follow up with uh, Councilman, Council Member uh, Shule's piece about park, uh, school um, recreation facilities. We went on a tour, the uh, Environmental Affairs Board uh, went on a tour of, of green infrastructure, and we looked at the playground at George Watt School, uh, and that is a wonderful place that it can be used f for that community as a park area also. So lots of things might be considered with our schools. Okay. Are there any other comments by members of the council? If not, uh, Chris Jets. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mayor Bell, uh, City Council. Um, I'm Chris Dreps, the Executive Director of the Ellerby Creek Watershed Association, and I live at 520 Wildwood Drive. And I just want to stand up here tonight. I think it's a great plan, and the association fully supports the urban open space plan. Um, I want to commend your city planning, city county planning staff for the good work they did. Um, particularly, I want to point out, uh, since she didn't get a chance to be here tonight, and she's not in the position anymore, but Helen Youngblood, H Helen Youngblood, who worked hard to include many stakeholders in the process of developing the plan, um, uh, she did a great job with us, too. And I want to stress that the Ellerby Creek Watershed Association has protected lands that are actually keystones in this urban open space plan. Um, for example, the Beaver Marsh Preserve. Um, and we hope to assist the city in protecting priority properties in the future where our conservation goals are aligned. See us as a resource. Um, there are several of those, and I won't talk about those obviously in this meeting, um, but we do look forward to the opportunity to work directly with your staff on those projects. In addition, um, the cost of urban lands is skyrocketing. As, as we know by several of the conversations here tonight. And it will be critical for Durham to budget adequate funding to protect the priority properties identified in this plan. We request that you commit funds for urban land protection to implement this plan. Um, your focus on these priorities will lead to a better, greener, healthier, and more livable Durham in 20 years. And that is the window we have for this plan. So thank you all for, um, thank you for the, the plan, thank you for the work that's been done and passing the plan, supporting the plan. And I also wanna say that um, Greece is, uh, it's put in by people who are flushing it down city, down their kitchen sinks and other places and it's one of the reasons why a lot of your staff work really hard on trying to educate the community about not flushing grease down the drain. It gets in the drain pipes, it clogs the drains up, and it causes overflows. And that one area down in South Ellerby Creek that isn't talked about in this plan is a real problem area. I know it's probably cost the city a lot of money over the years. Thanks for that education. And I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't really connect that to the, this other level of pollution, but maybe that is what they're talking about. So thanks, Chris. 
Are there other persons that would like to speak on this item? This being a public hearing matter. Uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. Uh, declare public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the board. Now the staff has recommended, requested that we approve the plan as presented, and we've heard some comments by the mayor pro tem and councilman Shule. So I would entertain a motion if someone wants to make a motion to approve the plan to take into consideration the comments that have been made so both at the dais and the public hearing. So. It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there a discussion on the question? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion and came by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we move to the next item on the public hearing, which is street closing for East Road B. Good evening, Kyle T with the Planning Department. <clears throat> I can affirm that the public notice for this item has been executed in accordance with general statute in uh, the UDO and that affidavits of such are on file in the Planning Department. Southside Renovation Phase 2 LP proposes to close 28 linear feet of Road B. The applicant proposes to close this section of road due to the relocation of the road associated with Southside East Phase 2. The right of way is currently dedicated but not improved. The portion of the street requested for closure is bordered by property owned by Southside Renovations uh, Phase 2 LP. If this request is approved, the adjacent parcels and right of way will be combined into one parcel of land with an area of 5.31 acres. Staff recommends that council approve the permanent closure of 28 linear feet of road B. Thank you and staff is available for any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report or the questions by council and staff report. Uh, is anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item, this being a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter's back before the council. Exactly. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor of the motion, they keep saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes. Unanimously, we move to item 21, refunding of general obligation bonds series 2007. An issuance of general, general obligation, two-thirds bonds. Good evening, uh, David Boyd, Finance Director. Uh, the public hearing tonight is being held pursuant to state law relative to the issuance of not more than $6.6 .6 million in general obligation, two-thirds bonds. Uh, after the public hearing, City Council will be asked to consider the adoption of bond orders for both the two-thirds bonds along with not more than $18.2 million in general obligation refunding bonds. Uh, we've included the relevant information in with uh, your agenda packet and we're happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Are there questions of the staff by members of the council? Uh, likewise, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? I'll let the record reflect no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed and matters back before the council. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. I assume that's the move in this terms of the staff recommendation. Yes, sir. Uh, that being the case, all in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 22, public hearing on the economic development incentive with reinvestments partners. Uh, Mayor Bell, members of council, my name is Chris Dickey with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Before you is an item to consider an approval of a proposed agreement between the city of Durham and reinvestment partners. Reinvestment partners has applied to OEWD for a neighborhood revitalization grant incentive in the amount of $100,000 in support of its proposed expansion within the community development area outside the downtown development tier. Reinvestment Partners is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advocate for economic justice and opportunity by advocating a change in lending practices of financial institutions and to promote the health of wealth building for underserved communities. In addition to advocating, reinvestment partners have been active in garb and actively engaged in commercial revitalization of properties in selected neighborhoods by partnering with the City of Durham, such as 1201 and 1202 North Roxborough Street, 836 North Mangan Street, and 902 North Mangan Street. These projects receive $148,370 in public dollars and private investments of $533,377. Reinvestment Partners proposes to renovate a vacant, blighted two-story apartment duplex at 1208 Fayetteville Street and convert into 
1,765 square foot of office space. The office space will be leased to Sunrise Recovery Resource Center, a nonprofit substance abuse treatment program. Uh, um, the total project cost would be $416,000, and the public cost into this project would be $100,000 if approved. In addition to that, other deliverables, the company shall expend a minimum of $309,500 in hard costs, and also the company will adhere to a Durham based uh, business plan for construction related trades. The, pro the proposed project, when completed, will be a key step in implementing the neighborhood assessment plan that was approved by City Council. This calls for renovation of blighted and underutilized buildings as a means of attracting private capital investment to promote business development along this targeted core. The opportunity to attract this type of capital investment is somewhat challenging since it, since it is considered a high risk for successful economic de development. This project will serve as a catalyst project to attract additional business and office space development to this area. Uh, staff is here to answer questions. Recognize. So, which plan for construction are you adhering to on this project? Did you say the local? No, the, this, the Durham base. The Durham base place, right? The, the city of Durham has a. Uh, we have a Durham base plans. Any every neighborhood incentive grant that uh, that the Office of Economic Development has brought before you, what is included at is a, as a Durham based business plan. What we try to do is promote business development here within the city by by having an agreement assigned with, uh, with, in this case, would be in re reinvestment partners, and then they would set a goal to hire Durham-based business or purchase services and goods from Durham-based businesses. Yeah, I, I understand that part. I just wanted to know. I just want to make sure that since you would be in the Haiti area, yep. that there would be some sensitivity to yes. the use of businesses based there. Right. Thank you. Other other questions. This is for a recovery center. Yes. Well, a, a recovery center will be is for the development of office space, but a recovery center is a nonprofit organization that, that has an agreement with reinvestment partners to lease that space. But I, I want to make sure the purpose of the use of the building is is for clients who are recovering. Yes. Yes, sir. Are there, are there questions by members of the council? Uh, again, this is a public hearing. Let me ask other persons in the public that want to speak on this item. Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak. I declare the public hearing to be closed. As a matter of fact, before the council, I recognize the mayor pro tem. So we're going to you're going to serve clients who live in Durham and Raleigh, or just Durham? I'll, um... Since I I see that. Um, Sunrise is a program, it's a Raleigh Durham area based nonprofit. Right. So I just want to know who right. they are. Uh, Madam Pro Chair, we have uh, Peter Skillen from Reinvestment Partners, and okay. he can give Thank you, you more detail. Uh, Council Member, they'll actually be primarily serving people from that neighborhood. From that neighborhood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Are there other questions on it? This item, I, the the house definitely needs uh, renovation. Uh, the only concern I had was the use of the house and how the neighborhood would accept this. And I don't know if you've had any comments with any persons in in the neighborhood in particular. Um, yes, Mayor Bell, we presented to the PAC four. Okay. Uh, very lively and extensive conversation, uh, and at the end, questions were answered and they supported it. I've also received a letter of support from the Lincoln Community Health. And we've done outreach to all the adjoining property owners, and we hope to continue building in that community. Well, thank you for the record. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Uh, any further discussion? If not, entertain a motion on the item. So moved. Sir. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 23, public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petition utility improvements. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 23 is to consider the adopting a resolution rescinding six previously ordered petitioned utility improvements. 
Staff recommends that council conduct a public hearing, receive comments, and adopt a resolution rescinding the six previously ordered petition improvements listed on the agenda. Be happy to answer any questions council may have. All right, I recognize Councilman Shule. Is there anyone else on the council? Councilman Shule for comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Robert, um, I missed the February 9th work session for my son's wedding. Uh, so I have a question that I'm sure you probably answered at that time, but maybe could answer again for me. So these utility extensions originally were made for some good reason. And how will these needs now be fulfilled if we rescind them? So the, these, all of these six uh, utility projects were petitioned uh, by a majority of the residents in the selected area at the time and they were brought forward to council and, and deemed as sufficient petitions. A uh, sufficient petition at that time required um, in, the, in the service area, it required um, the majority of property owners and the majority of frontage. And so all of those items uh, were deemed access acceptable and those items were, were brought in front of council. In the event that these utility petition projects are not uh, accepted or are not rescinded, uh, yes, sir, then the citizens would look at alternatives to serve those. They could band together and fulfill their own uh, uh, utility extensions and seek a petition uh, for utility improvements and possible annexation under City of Durham rules. They could also seek additional protections and other items under uh, the state. Um, new wells, uh, new septic systems, uh, new community systems as afforded under those rules. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's city manager. Rob, could you please, uh, just for the record, uh, I know we covered this at the work session, just clarify the the reason for the staff recommendation and what's changed that uh, is, is the basis for uh, for this recommendation to rescind the petitions. Yes, sir. Um, so in the process of uh, reviewing these developments and setting them up for designs, preliminary meetings were held with the Public Works Department and NCDOT and some of the other affected uh, partners that look at the design parameters of these items. Substantial changes in those uh, requirements would require entire rebuilds of the street sections in the affected areas, uh, which is significantly increasing the costs. Um, these cost projections add about $2.2 million to the total cost of the six projects. And then just to go a little bit deeper, so the original uh, approval, what was the cost sharing uh, arrangements between the city and the, and the property owners in the original approval? So the original approval contains a couple of different items. So there are actual set rates based on linear foot frontages. But in totality, the original estimated costs for the initial estimates were about $930,000. The maximum assessments that could be made for all the citizens if, if everything was collected uh, was roughly just shy of 800000 about 797 and change. So as a result of the increased cost then, the, uh, the, under the current methodology or the current petitions, those uh, costs for the residents are capped and the city would be expected to pick up the That is correct. Uh, so difference. yes. And none of these properties are in the city limits? That is correct. None of these properties are in the city limits. And so if the petitions were rescinded, would the um, petitioners uh, have the opportunity to refile under a new set of rules? Yes, sir. And what would those rules be? Uh, so the petitioners could refile uh, and they could petition for annexation uh, under those. And uh, they would have higher assessment rates but those all wouldn't fully capture the costs. Um, the citizens would also have to petition for uh, acceptance, um, you know, annexation. And there's not an opportunity for them to petition without annexation unless their services are de de deemed um, so they would be able to or problematic by the health department. 
Yes, sir. So there would be some uh, basically fact finding that they'd have no other options. Thank you. That's Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Joyner, at the work session, I asked about the possibility of installing utilities not in the roadway but in adjoining property if the if the property owners um, were willing to have the city do that. Uh, I can, and I don't remember. It seemed like what I recollect is that you were going to take a look at that just to see about the possibility. Do you, uh, do you that is that? that is possible in some cases. Um, in other cases, the houses are sufficiently close to the uh, road frontage as to prohibit that effectively. In addition to that, one of the other notes that was made is the, the actual use of the heavy equipment would physically destroy the roads themselves. And so we would be liable just for placing the equipment on the roads to access the utilities adjacent to the roads. So that was one of the determinations made by NCDOT as well. So in some cases, I think even if we did install utilities outside the physical uh, roadway itself, there would be additional damages that would, that would have to be dealt with. I do have one more question. I, it's more of a curiosity. But uh, if people on both sides of the road petition for annexation, does, the, does NCDOT then still have the road? Is the road itself not in the city limits? Is that, this sounds like it wouldn't be up to our standards. I'm just, it, don't, don't worry about it. Thanks. If it's, if it's an easy question, I was just curious about what So the petition for annexation is completely separated from acceptance of a roadway infrastructure. So those are two separate council decisions. Are there other questions by members of the council at this time? If not, we have several people that have signed up to speak on this item, and I assume that they have numbers beside their sign-up sheets which indicate they may be interested in a particular road. I'm just going to call each name, and if you can come to the podium to the right, uh, each have three minutes. And um, I, don't, I only have one person that is speaking in support of this. The others are opponents. Uh, Kellogg Kynes, is that the name? I'm having problems reading this right. Uh, Skip Couch. Skip Couch present. Callie uh, Kerner. Callie Kerner. Come to the podium to the right. I'm sorry. I mean, have, does the person want to sound up to speak? If they want to sound, okay. Who, who is? What is his name? That's this one. Okay, Kelly King. That's, have we have your name. And so, uh, Alfred. Eisner. They're trying to add time. No, let me say this: the the process that we have, and I know you, some of you probably not, have not been here. We don't yield time, so if you want to speak, you each have three minutes, but you can't yield your time to someone else. So if you want to speak, you're perfectly privileged to speak, but you have to speak on your time. So Alfred Eisner, I spoke. Teresa Price. And now, is there anyone's name that I didn't call that would like to speak on this item? What's, could you pronounce your name? Uh, because I couldn't read it. Well, that, that's fine. It's not your problem. It's my problem. I couldn't read it. What is your name? I hadn't called your name because you were speaking for you weren't against, right? So I didn't call you. All right, no problem. Okay, if, we, if, 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 if you can come to the podium, I know this is the first time, but don't, don't feel bad about that. Come to the podium, just state your name and address, and you have three minutes, and we have a clock over to the right for you to speak. And these are all persons who are speaking in opposition to what's being proposed, correct? Yes. Okay. My name's Teresa Price. I live at 1503 Stallings Road. So I'm requesting that you not rescind the improvements on Stallings Road. I purchased this property in 1998. I did all the necessary steps. I was sold the property under misguidance. It had no water at the time, a fifth of a gallon a minute, which is not much. It takes 50 gallons to do a load of clothes. 
we could not, we, we drilled wells. We brought in water from other cities. I got a huge tank. I had to do bottled water. We had every well collapse. There's three wells on the property and we dug a fourth one that collapsed. We got a, I got a neighbor to agree to allow me to go through my back part of my property, 4,000 feet, through another road. The city required me to do a petition. This was in 2007, 10 years ago. I did the petition. I was required to pay fees to connect on my road and the temporary easement, fee, the connection assessment for my property, plus a, what was called a capital facilities fee at the time just to get the temporary um, easement through my neighbor's property. It's a temporary easement. It's only good while I'm alive. I cannot sell my home. The property owner would not sell me that easement. And I paid the first payment. It was put on hold in 2008. That was the last communication I received until this hearing. I did stop making the payments because nothing had ever happened. It was put on hold. And I felt like it wasn't fair for me to be making assessment payments on property that hadn't even been approved to build. This recent announcement, I was told that it was approved to be built in 2010, seven years ago, I mean, nine years ago. And today, it still hasn't been even put into the you know, plan to be built. And I still, if I were to die tomorrow, my children can't even use their own home. My son was born when I bought this house. He's 18 and graduating now. I, I have went through all those resources. You know, the wells, I've had water tested. I have done everything and followed every process that the city required. And you know, now I am have paid money in and still don't not have water 10 years later. And I'm not in a subdivision that can have community wells, or, you know, or access. And you know, I have spent well over thirty thousand dollars just in digging wells alone. So I just ask that it not be rescinded, and I ask that it not be ten years to build if it's not rescinded. To please, you know, do it at some time so I can do something with my property, or you know, at least my children will be able to do something with their home. My name's Kelly King. My address is 5611 Redcoach Road, which is in the Grand Oak subdivision, which is one of the six subdivisions being considered tonight. I'd like to say that I've been there. I was there in 2007 when this petition was filed. I was there in 2007 when the city approved this petition and signed it. I was there in 2007 when the proceed work order was signed by the city of Durham. I was also there when work commenced on this project in 2007 and 2008 and stopped for reasons that no one seems to know why. I was also there and had meetings with the state of North Carolina in probably 2006 concerning the septic system in this subdivision, which is who told us to come and do this petition to the city of Durham. I also been in meetings with the county of Durham in probably 2006 concerning this sewer system and what were the options for the neighborhood. I'd like to agree with the lady before me that the city staff's recommendations of they could, they could, they could. Well, we have, we have, we have. This was our last option. This is what the state of North Carolina and Durham County told my neighbors and myself, this is your only option. All his other options that he mentioned, he just does not know. He was not there and he hadn't done the research. I've sent documents for you guys to use through uh, Laura Edcock. I don't know where they are. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention, I've been sitting here, my neighbor's been sitting here for 10 years wondering when are they going to finish it. We have heard nothing, nothing from the city of Durham in 10 years about when they were going to finish it. We got this letter that the city of Durham drafted on May the 5th, 
which does not mean I got it on May the 5th. I got it on May the 7th or the 8th. And today's the 15th. Now the city of Durham has took 10 years to come up with this idea. And we're not even talking about the cost. We're just talking about what is fair to Durham residents, which I'm a taxpayer in the city of Durham also. What is fair? The city of Durham has took 10 years to think about this and then just decide, oh, we're not going to follow through with obligations that we signed to these people in this neighborhood 10 years ago that we agreed to and we signed, work that we commenced on. Now, all of a sudden, we got new staff members that says, oh, we're just not going to build it. We're going to spend $100,000 over on this park. And we're going to spend $100,000 over here. Good projects. Just finish the one that you started. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Skip Couch. I'm at 1823 Grand Oaks Road in the Grand Oaks subdivision. Been there since 1985. And I've been through, been that, what Kelly just talked about. Um, since then, they've had water and sewer uh, brought down uh, Umstead Road, which is probably a mile from our subdivision or less. They built two subdivisions right around the backs up to our subdivision that has water and sewer. And uh, so cost should be a little bit better than it was when they first started talking about this stuff. Um, this is a failing sewer system folks and is you know we don't need to go talk about anything else but what's really going on in our sewer system now you know what what's going what's where is it going who who's talking about kids in the future and everything they're going to play in those parks and stuff around our neighborhoods and stuff where is this sewage really going to now thank you My name is Alfred Eisner, and I live on uh, 5610 Red Coach Road, which is involved in this issue. Um, I was surprised to receive this letter on uh, just basically five days ago. And I just want to make um, two points. I uh, purchased my property maybe uh, four years ago. And um, when I discovered the issue, of the uh, sewer system, uh, I made a contact with the city engineer and invited him to uh, uh, visit me and uh, it was nice of him to show up and explain all the engineering aspects of uh, construction that will be necessary. Um, but um, of course, one uh, things of my concern was the cost. And one thing that he explicitly emphasized that the cost to uh, property owners is capped regardless of the delays of the work. And um, uh, no one should worry about any cost increases in case the work is delayed. And he promised that the work will start within a year of me uh, purchasing the property. And uh, it's uh, almost four years and nothing happened until this letter suddenly shows up in my uh, uh, mailbox. I um, followed the instructions in this letter to uh, contact uh, Ms. Laura Edcock uh, in terms of questions, and I got no response, um, which, of course, um, is not a pleasant experience. My question was, why did the city wait 10 years to commence this project when everybody knows that all works of this nature uh, increase in cost all the time. Thank you. I'm gonna have to apologize. I think I checked that card wrong. I'm for water and sewer, and I'm on East Gear Street, which is the Gorman okay, okay. community. Let's just put a record. 
State your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Name. I'm D. Shankel at 2919 East Gear Street in Durham, okay. 27704. 30 years ago, maybe 20, I don't know the chronology exactly, a sewer line was put down parallel with Gear Street all the way out in Falls Lake. Water was put there too. We got water. That's not a problem. Here's the problem. You have a subdivision called Panther Creek and another one called Carp Carpenter Pond that were incorporated into the city. They look like little islands on the map and they got water and sewer, full services. Gear Street, once again, was left there with no sewer. These homes are the original homes on Highway 15, which was the road to Oxford before they be built I-85. The septic systems are 50 and 60 years old now. We don't have the money to start digging new wells and septic tanks, unless you're gonna lend it to me. It's ridiculous to suggest otherwise. We just want healthy water and sewer the way every other person and the city and the city out processes have. The demographics <clears throat> of these six places that you have here are middle class, blue collar people that work for a living, they have jobs and they pay taxes. They're not on the public dole. And frankly, <clears throat> without being ugly or getting thrown out of here, we're sick of it. Guess you heard me that time. I can fix the sound system for you. That's the worst PA I've ever heard, but you know, that's my business too. It's terrible. I, we couldn't hear anything anybody was saying. It just needs to be tweaked out. And yeah, I do have an anger issue when it comes to like, you know, I want clean drinking water. And when I flush my toilet, I don't want the dog bringing it back in the house. My system's pretty healthy. I take care of it. I'm an you know, engineer by trade on many different levels. But my neighbors don't feel that way. Most of them are elderly. They think they're going to be rezoned so you can bulldoze their houses and build a bunch of crap out there. We are in our ancestors' homes that we've lived there for three generations. We just want a fair shake. We want clean drinking water. We want sewer systems that don't overflow and pollute the groundwater. We also live within two landfills that were there for 30 and 40 years. And the groundwater there, frankly, has not, you know, I wouldn't use your labs for this. I work at the EPA. I can have the water tested in that area. And I guarantee you it's not going to be up to standard just because of what's been in the ground for that long. We just want a fair shake to be treated like everybody else that works for a living and works hard and we can't go dig in community wells and septic tanks and systems like that. It's beyond our economic grasp. I hope you understand that. I hope you do the right thing and give us, just give us the same benefits and health, you know, processes that each individual has in Durham City. If you want to annex us, that's fine. You did with Carpenter Pond and uh, Panther Creek. Look at the map. Look at the sewer line that's been there for many years. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't spoken? Sure, come on. You're Ms. Price. Yeah. One thing that I, I forgot to mention while I was up here, my road, there's city water at one end, city water 800 feet from my house, the main. There's a, about a thousand foot difference that doesn't have the city water. It's amazing there was a, a petition filed at the other end of my road, but it was a builder. They built new houses, they got city water. My little section, nothing happened. So I just think that, you know, it's a 800 feet, maybe a thousand max. So I just wanted to make that clear too, that there's builders can get it done um, with the city. But if you're an individual owner, it's, it's very difficult. What's the name of the street you live on? Stallin, Stallins Road. And it, it butts up to Mineral Springs Road, which has city water. And part of Stallins has city water. As the mayor pro tem. I just have a question for Robert. <laughs> Could you explain this 10-year gap in movement, if that's what has occurred? Marvin Please. Williams, Public Works. So over the last several years, we've had a lot of our focus in our capital side shift. It's really been moving away from a lot of these utility extension projects over to transportation projects. So we've had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act projects that we've done. We've had multiple sidewalk projects, street projects, our annual resurfacing program, 
just a lot of maintenance type capital projects. So our really our focus has moved away from utility extensions. We haven't had any that have been built in the last several years. Um, and a lot of the construction that the residents are referring to have been private developers in this area that have extended city water and sewer. So it's not necessarily that the city staff have done it for other neighborhoods. It's been other private development and our attention has been on other projects that have been given a higher priority over the years. The escalated costs have to do with so the, the cost increases are a combination of time. Obviously, the construction costs have gone up. And also changing requirements from the North Carolina Department of Transportation that would require us to essentially go in and rebuild the roads when we install city utilities at these locations. So the, that's a big part of this cost increase that we never took into account initially when these estimates were prepared years ago because it wasn't a requirement at that point. So new requirements. Of course. And so, Mr. Price, you've spent $30,000 already or more? Now, I've upgraded level one property. I've upgraded past it, but I didn't finish the property. Uh, when I actually purchased the property, they told me that they Mr. Price, Mr. Price, Price, can you come, you come to the... Come over here. I'm sorry. Um, when I actually purchased the property, I was told that the, the property already had easements paid that there was no, no assessments due. I took that to mean city water went by the property. The day we moved in, we, we discovered otherwise. So after that, you know, I sought, sought legal advice, was told there was nothing that could be done. I was stuck. I drilled wells. The well went 400 feet deep, had to have a liner. It, it, it collapsed. There was three other wells. The well, I think, ended up costing me close to $15,000 with all the lining and everything on the property. I've been, um, had the water tested. I had to have an 18 wheeler bring me water in a big igloo, 6,000 gallon tank that I had to put chemicals in and my children weren't allowed to drink it for six years. And I had to climb up there and put it all in there and this truck would deliver me water once a month. Um, and I did that for eight years. And then I finally had a neighbor agree to give me the easement. And that's when I was told that the only way the city would allow me to do the temporary easement through my neighbor's property that gave me permission was that I start paying the assessment fees, the $23 a foot for my entire line and pay all the other fees. And then, you know, 10 years later, it still hasn't been anything done. And I didn't even know it was approved to, to be built in 10, 2010 and that they were gonna start because I was never notified until the five days ago when I got the letter saying it was gonna be rescinded. But, but I've gotten collection calls saying they were gonna foreclose on my house because I didn't pay. I stopped paying after a year. Stop I stopped paying the, month, the annual assessment. They to started the making me pay the fees to bring city water down my road. To the city. To the city. Okay. I paid over $1,000 in assessment fees for something that wasn't even, was put on hold. So then I stopped making the payments. I made phone calls. I never got return calls. You know, I got charged interest every year. They're telling me I owe $10,000, $9,000 now to the city. But it, there's not even any, anything being approved to come down for my 800 feet to my property. Who's going to foreclose? Uh, the city. The city told me they were going to put a lien on my house. And when I called, a lady over the phone and said, oh, don't worry, they're not going to do that. I said, well, it's in a letter you sent me from your collections department that you're going to foreclose on my house for me not paying assessment fees for something that hadn't even was put on hold in 2008. Um, you know, so I've, I've spent over $3,000 just to the city for dual hookups. One to the temporary one, one to one that doesn't exist, one for fees to do the planning, and then all my road frontage, which is about 400 feet. And I did leave Laura a message as well and said, you know, if this gets rescinded, is the city going to pay me back my $1,000 with the 9% interest that I've been charged over the years and pay me back this capital assessment fee that I paid for and the hookup fee? And I haven't gotten an answer. Now, granted, I, I give her credit. I did not call until I was out of town last week when the letter came in. So it was first thing this morning when we discovered it on Sunday when we got back in town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your time.
You're welcome. Let, let me, uh, first of all, I, I don't want to close the public hearing. Uh, I really, Mr. Manager, need to get a better understanding of what's, what's being proposed here. Uh, I, I've heard the comments from the residents that are being impacted, and I've heard the staff report, but uh, I'll just be honest with you, I haven't absorbed it all, and I, I just need more time to, to understand it. it. It troubles me that we're talking about an event that supposed to have taken place 10 years ago, that for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And I'm not saying whose fault it was, but I just need to, need to have a better understanding of it. And I, right now, I really don't. But I don't know the other comments that persons have. Uh, I recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm still not totally clear on the timeline. So what happened in 2007, what happened in 2010, and what, like why there was this long gap in um, in the in the process of doing this so really it's marvin williams public works it's really essentially what i said earlier it's reprioritization of projects public works we are limited on staff we are limited on the amount of money that we have available for design consultants and as we go through the budget process every year and the reprioritization of projects that are assigned to us transportation related projects have been our focus for the last at least six to seven years you also have to take into account that we had the large general obligation bond paying program that happened in 2010, 2011, 2012. When you combine all those projects get together, it really takes a lot of staff time. And these projects, unfortunately, utility extension projects, not just for these particular developments, but just all of the utility extension projects have been pushed down lower in our list of priority projects to move through the process on an annual basis. And while that was going on, we were in discussion with the North Carolina Department of Transportation about their ever-changing requirements, about construction related to utilities on their roadways, and their requirements have been changing over the years. So it is really a somewhat of a perfect storm, unfortunately, where we had a lot of other projects that were happening at the same time. These projects, at some point in time, weren't deemed to be a high priority, so they were moved down to a lower level. And it's just taken this long for this issue to really come to the point of coming back to council for some type of policy direction on where we should go next. Um, do people generally pay assessments before <coughs> the work starts? To no, they in? don't. I would like to talk to the residents after the meeting to find out what it is that they're paying or have paid, because I'm not aware of any assessments that have been imposed against them, because we normally don't assess until after the work has been completed. So I'm not sure what it is that has been paid, but I would be happy to talk to you to get more information and clarify what that has been for. And we don't have any plans to put liens against the property or foreclose either. That's not something that we do when it comes to these types of projects at all or in general in public works. Great, thank you. And could you, are all these properties are in the county? Correct. Could you, um, I, I feel like there may be a little bit of a misunderstanding on what the city is required to do in terms of extending utilities to county properties and how people in the county can get access to city utilities could you just go over the like the options for how county residents can get access to city services so really this process the petition process is the best way um, i think there was another agenda item recently where residents outside of the city came for they may have been inside the city but they identified that they had a failed well and that they had no other option to have access to clean water other than through the city utilities well, we either need to have that sufficient petition or some type of notification from the county or state health department that clearly shows that there is a failed system that you do need access to clean water and this is the city's utilities are the only option at that time and is, is that the kind of petition that we're talking about today someone applied saying we have a failed system and the city utilities is the only option. so i believe this petition was just a straight petition to connect to city utilities at the time it was originally presented by the members of these various communities. I do not believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there, we had any documentation. I'm, I'm speaking in general about all, all of the projects in its totality. There may be one or two that have that specific documentation, but not all together. Do we have the, all of the information showing that there's no other option for other than city utilities? Okay, and so, and so in this situation, the city has discretion to connect or not connect properties to the water and sewer system. At, at this point, we do, and that's why we brought the item forward once we saw the cost escalation to see what was the pleasure of the council since it is serving residents outside of the city. If the, it was a desire to move forward with the project at this time or reevaluate, 
um, allow the residents to repetition under the current rates so that there is a higher cost recovery because as a department public works we have no opposition to the project we're just making the council aware of the cost implications if we do move forward under the old structure of this petition um, and for folks who currently don't have access to water and sewer or the wells or septic are a health hazard, they would have the option of petitioning for a hookup under those rules that, that we would be obligated to hook them up if, they're, um, if their system tested, no. that they would have to come back and re-petition us for that. Uh, no, ma'am. There is no explicit, Robert Joyner, Public Works, there is no uh, explicit requirement where the city is required uh, to do that for properties outside the city limits. Okay, but we generally do. If it is available, in most cases where you see a petition that occurs uh, on a, uh, uh, a well that has contaminated water supplies or a completely failed septic system, those utilities are actually already present uh, adjacent to the properties. So the hookup is instantaneous. There's not actually an extension of mains to serve the area, which in this, all of these cases would be required. Okay, thank you. Councilman Shul, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So are there others like this out there? Are these, you know, are there other similar um, Will you be coming back to us with other uh, projects to, that, or at least can you anticipate that you'll be coming back to us with other, uh, that have, uh, that, that would be rescinded? Or the, is this kind of the group that you have? This is the group that are outside of the city limits. We have some others that are within the city limits, but these have the most extraordinary costs at this point. Yeah. And the, um, And the, and the costs, it sounds like, are really due to two things, if I understand you correctly. One is the, the fact that time has passed and construction costs are higher. And the other, though, it seems like a very significant one, is the fact that NCDOT has informed us that there would be road work required, street reconstruction required that would be very expensive. Correct. Is that most of the cost, or is most of it from time passing a, a large portion of it is the rotary construction that's nothing that's something we did not take into account during our initial estimates in terms of the um, the notice that people got did they get the required notice and uh, under the required timeline yes do, do we have a requirement is yes a requirement? We, we followed all timelines required to notify people that would be impacted b about this okay. project and so um, would that include people getting notice for tonight as late as I think May 5th was mentioned, 10 days ago? Um, I believe that might have been. It's, that is correct. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess, Mr. Mary, in terms of the public hearing, I mean, I'd be interested in some more information about these uh, projects. And uh, I can see why, I mean, this is a, enormous cost uh, and I can see why we why you brought this forward uh, and uh, I, you know I, I, I also the city doesn't have a responsibility to fix everybody's lives in the county's water and sewer situation even if it's difficult and so I know that's not what you want to hear but I think we have to, we are trying to be good stewards of our taxpayers' money, and uh, you all are in specific situations. You know, all of you are in different situations because of decisions that you made and also unforeseen things that happened. I understand that, and I know that's difficult. But I do think we have to measure that against, you know, what the costs are to our taxpayers and what our obligations are. Uh, but I would be, you know, I, it seems like one of the things I can't quite parse here is that it seems like there are there's six 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 separate you know different situations and um, you know I can't tell you know I mean are the sewer 
you know, the, uh, the sewer and water projects, is there any significant difference in why we should care about extending one of them over the other? Um, you know, that kind of thing. And so I just, you know, a little bit more information and guidance I would find useful. So, thank you. Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned being good stewards because I wasn't only concerned about the city, but I am concerned about the city taxpayers who would be asked to fund $2 million to run water and sewer to uh, homes outside the city. Uh, to, uh, my question is, I, I can see there's six projects. How many homes are we, do we know? I mean, do you, I know we, you know, but. We do not have that information tonight, but we can have that available in a follow-up okay. memo to the council. And um, so, so one alternative would be for them to petition for annexation, is that correct? That is correct, they do have that but, option. But if they petition for annexation, and water service. We're back in the same, they'll become city taxpayers, so they'll help carry the burden of the extra $2 million. A but, portion of it. But we'll still be in the same situation of having to um, rebuild state roads. Right? Correct. Okay. And, and is it, uh, one of the things that Mr. Joyner said was that when people come with failed systems, typically the water and sewer that when we approve those water and sewers nearby and, and connections are uh, relatively quick i'm putting words in his mouth relatively painless correct um has it just been that all of those failed systems have been when easy access of our utilities or are people who don't have easy access to city utilities decide it's not worth it to push the petition forward what happens how is it that the only ones we've seen are near city utilities, do you know? Most of the residents who find themselves with no available access or direct access to the city utilities uh, have tremendous amount of trouble uh, listing a petition and getting enough signatures to make it valid. It's a very difficult process. Um, in order to get everybody to sign the the amount of money that is spent on some of these things and the potential uh, cost implications are can be tremendous there is some cap but in outfalls and other things those are assessed at cost and those costs can be tremendous for extension of a sewer outfall okay thanks thank you mr mayor robert in, in a normal course of things, when persons petition for utilities, such as this case, and they get the required number of signatures, then what does the city tell them? So at that time, uh, the city takes the signature list and, and vets it against the existing property owners to make sure that the petition is sufficient. And once city staff has determined the, the sufficiency of the petition, then we bring forward an agenda item to city council petitioning on behalf of the owners. Uh, it holds a public hearing uh, exactly like this one, and the uh, homeowners have the opportunity to petition the council directly for those findings, sir. Well, I'm saying what happened in this case, because they, they did the petition, it came before the city council at some point in time. And that is correct. These petitions were done in 2007, 2010, and 2011. They were brought before the council, and the council at that time voted uh, voted to to uh, allow those petitions to be successful. Okay, so that, that and so I, if I'm a petitioner, I assume that since the council's approved it, at some point in time, I'm going to get the service. I would assume that's it. Yes, sir. Uh, until so, until what? Until I don't get the service? Until the city comes back and tells us we're going to give you the service? At the time when the projects are uh, looking at closer to construction, uh, we hold meetings with the residents and inform them of the, uh, when the project will, will come forward. In this particular instance, as those projects were being uh, reviewed and looked at for design solutions, uh, one of the requirements of doing that due diligence for the design is to talk to the local uh, reviewing agency. And in this case, that local reviewing agency was NCDOT since all of these projects are located in the county. 
upon review of those projects with NCDOT, it was determined that the roadway requirements, essentially the entire road would need to be rebuilt. And those costs and the cost of, of building those utilities in, in and adjacent to those roadways are what have triggered the substantial increase in dollars. But I think what I also heard, and correct me from Marvin, is that the reason that the staff didn't move any further on the project is because other things were coming up, transportation, et cetera, and therefore they never really focused on these, these units. Mm -hmm. And when they decide to focus on it, then that's when NCDOT said, Ops, here's what it's gonna cost you. And then the staff decided that that's a cost that you need to come back to the council and tell us here's what it's going to cost. So your recommendation was to just rescind the project. So I, I, I think that's what I, I heard. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, one, one, one other question about the um, assessment process. If a resident, I know what our assessment is. We have a rule that we use to assess property. But if, in fact, the property owners want to pay a high assessment, does anything say that they couldn't do that? No, sir. So Not that I'm aware of. So if, in fact, they wanted to pay a higher assessment to get these services, they could do that. And we, we could strike an agreement to say, okay, your assessment, instead of being $10 a square foot, $10 a foot is $20 a foot. If they agreed to that, would that be legal or something we could do? I would have to consult with the attorney's office okay. to get all the specifics of that, sir. All right. But I'm not aware of anything. Anything what? Uh, I'm not aware of anything that would prohibit Prevent, prohibit it from doing. Okay. Well, I'd just like to keep this open for a little bit more discussion. Rick, I'm sorry, Councilman Reese, I didn't see you. There. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so these are called utility extension agreements. Is that that's right? Uh, utility petition extensions. Utility. Yes, sir. Utility petition what? Extensions. Okay, but it's not an, it's not a utility extension agreement of any kind. Here's here's what I'm asking. Did we sign a contract with these folks? When it was voted, uh, when it was voted under the utility petition, uh, those owners completed what is referred to as an assessment role, and that role includes all of the names of the individuals, and that is included in the package when it's voted on as an agenda item. So it's not again. a utility extension agreement okay. in what you're used to seeing. But I'm going to try again. Similar form. Do we have a contract with these people to extend their utilities or not? And maybe the city attorney would be a better person to ask about that. I am not aware of one, but I could get that information for you. Okay. Um, I guess my concern here is that we agreed 10 years ago, in some cases, in some cases seven years ago, in some cases six years ago, to deliver a service to these folks. And I'm sure in many cases they could come up and explain to us what, what decisions they made in their lives between then and now in reliance on our agreement with them, whether it was an actual legal agreement or not, our agreement with them to provide these, so this service. Um, and maybe it's just because I'm a lawyer, but it doesn't feel right that these folks could make those decisions in their lives in reliance on, on an agreement that we reached with them to extend services. Um, and so. I don't know how we get them back to whole if we decided that we're just not going to do it because we don't we don't think it's too expensive. Um, but at the very least, I'd like to I'd like to have someone on the staff explore what that looks like. Um, at least you know, very minimally with the minimally with the fees that they uh, paid in. Um, I know this this woman's got a different situation I think, and we're going to have to have staff really dig in on what those assessments were that she paid. Uh, I know Marvin's gonna gonna look into that uh, as soon as we're done here, but I think for me to have comfort um, in agreeing to rescind these, I'm gonna have to understand what the what the staff would have the city do to make these folks whole. Um, and if we can't do that, then I'm then I'm gonna support doing what we said we would do. Um, and if it costs more money, then I can explain that to the voters of the city because we, in a sense. The city, because we made choices to delay this work for, in many cases, 10 years, I'm not sure why they should bear the burden of the risk that is assumed when we decided every year 
well, we're going to bump that project down the list. Perfectly valid decision. I'm sure had I been here, I would have agreed with it. But at the same time, every time we make that choice, we, there is a risk associated with that, that choice that the project will get more expensive when it was when we agreed with these people to do it. And the question I have now, 10 years on, is which party should bear that burden of risk? And we're saying here that the city apparently has the legal authority, although I'd love to hear the city attorney opine on this, the city has the legal authority just to shrug our shoulders and say, no, we're not going to do that. We've waited too long. It's too expensive now. Um, we have responsibilities to our taxpayers instead of the, the folks we came to this agreement with. That seems, like I said, I'm going to have to have someone in the city attorney's office help us understand how we have that authority to just walk away uh, from these folks. And so uh, I, I just wanted to make you all aware that that's kind of how I'm looking at this as we go forward. Um, and I appreciate the staff pausing to take a look, um, but it certainly wasn't put on our agenda as we're pausing to take a look and raising a flag. And, and so uh, maybe a little, the, the, the language that you used to communicate to us about that could have been a little different maybe. Um, but I appreciate all the staff work that went into this. And I certainly appreciate all the folks who are here tonight to talk to us about their problems. And uh, hopefully we can figure out a way uh, to do what's right. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule, Councilman Moffitt in that order. So one issue I just want to raise again is the issue of notice. I know that we met the letter of the law, but it, it does seem if folks got this as recently as early May, and, and this was the first time, was this the first time they might have heard of this after we have agreed previously to extend the, the utilities? Yes, sir. Um, under the requirements of the notice, uh, we hold uh, we go to the city council work session, and if the item isn't deferred at the work session, it will continue on to the council meeting. We mail those immediately that day or the following day uh, to provide the required notice under the law, sir. Okay, so the meeting was February 9th, I think, if I read this correctly. Yes. So you mail those on February 10th. No, sir. Uh, okay. The original meeting where we asked for direction from council on whether to bring this item forward was yeah. February 9th. Okay. And that was, so we held a, a, a meeting with council to make a determination on uh, how to bring this item forward. Okay. And then at the previous council work session, right. uh, approximately uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. A little under two weeks ago. Okay, and we just pass it on consent and here we are. Yes, sir. And when we pass it on consent, or we put it on the consent agenda, you then the next day mailed out the notices. Yeah. Yes, sir. And is that a practice that we have, or is that a legal requirement that we do it that way? It's a combination of things. Okay. Uh, we do that as a practice to allow city council time to, uh, that's our first uh, introduction of the item to City Council and that allows yeah. them to to push that item back to staff yeah. for additional information okay um, and if we mail out immediately after that we then meet the notice as required by law yeah so let's just say this went all by all of us we would put it on consent at oh it was public hearing item that's why it, yes, we sir. didn't talk about it I got it Okay, and so uh, thank you, thank you for that. And then, but none of these folks would have known to have been there because they wouldn't have had any notice? Yes, sir. Right. So I just wanna say that does seem like a problem. You know, in the future, I think we really need to think about that. Um, I, I can see if it's some something very recent, but if it's something that's gone as long as these have it does seem like a, you know that we need to give more notice than that I can see why these people are upset that th then they could have come to the work session we could have had that discussion there we could have been more prepared for tonight you know the whole thing so I hope you all will think about that yes sir um, yeah so I, I'm agreeing with the mayor that we need a little bit more so that's councilman councilman Moffitt thank you um, just, just to be clear, sorry, Mr. Joyner, I'm not opining, I'm questioning. Just to be clear, 
We have a sidewalk, I mean, not a sidewalk. We have a, a petition process for numerous kinds of improvements, right? Yes, sir. Sidewalks, um, uh, dirt road, uh, street, uh, dirt street paving, um, and so forth, right? Yes, sir. And if I understand that process, and I, I think there's similarities, but if they're not, please correct me. Um, if people bring a petition forward. They say, we would like to have this stretch of sidewalk built, this, this uh, water main run. And that when the council at the time that it's accepted accepts it, they don't budget for it. They put it in the queue. Is that right? That is correct, sir. And um, I, I recollect um, that we have uh, unpaved streets that we have petitions on. We have sidewalks that we have petitions on. And now we're finding we have water mains and sewer mains that we have petitions on, all of which are not yet funded. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And so uh, it then falls to the council to budget to say, well, let's not, let's not do the park. Let's run the water main. Let's, let's, it falls to the council to decide how to budget that money. Is that? That is correct. Correct, sir. all right. Well, that got Mr. Williams up. So Marvin Williams, Public Works. So it's a little bit different because there are different funding sources okay. for the various projects. But in general, the concept that you're talking about is the same, that it would have to be accounted for in the annual capital improvement program that comes before council with the budget process right so I just I just want to I mean <laughs> I understand the angst and the concern that people have but I I certainly don't fault staff at all um, I, I'm remembering that we have been dealing with a lot of failed subdivisions for example um, and that a lot of things have gotten reshuffled post Great Recession um, that had to be dealt with, so including um, falling tax revenues. So we're in the situation, and I do want more information. I'm with everybody else here. So we're going to. So at the proper time, one of us, I'm sure, will we'll move to refer it back to staff for the time being, um, and and we'll go from there, I guess. Oh, I did want to ask on the petition process. I'm assuming that if people file petitions in 2007, that some of those people no longer own the property that they owned when they signed the petition. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So um, what, what happens then? Do we have to re-verify the petition? Does the, prop the person who bought the property have the obligation, the liability that the person who sold it signed the petition, or what? That is correct. The liability for the petition carries through to the new property owner. Okay, so we don't have to go back and re-verify People here don't have to be concerned that petitions won't be valid any longer. That's correct. It, okay. it, at the time of the petition, the sufficiency is determined at the time of the petition itself. So when it's voted on by council, all those, those items are verified at that time. Right. So any subsequent property transfers carry with it through to the new property owners. And at the time of the assessment process, after the work would be completed for a physical construction product, we notify all those property owners through a formal assessment role, which is a public hearing. Right. So, um, and when it, because I'm fairly confident it's coming back to staff, uh, back to council. When it does, when we see it, I'd, I, I would like to have some information about how many homes, a little more detailed information on each of these projects. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Let Mayor. me suggest that uh, we continue the public hearing until the 19th of June. Let me tell you why. Uh, It'll give us time between work sessions. It'll be our last meeting. I think the 5th of June, which is our next meeting, it's not going to give us the time to discuss it because we don't have another meeting until the 18th. And I don't think we're going to have this information by the 18th, which is Thursday. So I'm suggesting that we hold it, this public hearing open until the 19th of June, which will be our last meeting anyway. And meanwhile, we can figure out how we, we can have discussions. Probably we'd have a discussion of the work session. I, and I would assume that it will be proper to have this discussion at a work session, even though it's a public hearing matter. Normally, we don't discuss public hearing matters if they're rezoning issues. This is not a rezoning issue, it's a utility issue, so I assume we could have that discussion at that time. I recognize Councilman Shul. That sounds like a great idea. One other thing I'd be interested in knowing is, in terms of what else is out there like this. So you mentioned that these are the only ones in the county but that there might be other ones, I assume, then in the city that would be in similar situations vis-a-vis -vis the DOT road construction. Uh, the two that I know of that are inside the city limits are on city-owned streets or city 
maintain okay. the streets. And and when you say the two that you know about, what you know what about them exactly, Robert? You know what I'm asking? Uh, yes. So uh, the the two projects are utility extension projects, and uh, both of those are on city uh, city maintained streets. So are you saying that besides these six, there are only two other utility extension projects total? That I know in the queue, yes, sir. Okay. In the queue, meaning that there have been some sort of petition. So we, we do get requests from residents all the time about various types of petition projects, but not all of them are successful in getting a number of property owners that are necessary yeah. to bring the item back to council. So there are other petition requests out there, but none have been deemed sufficient enough to bring back to council for action. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to get at when you come back to us with more information is if we do this, if let's say that we were to fund this entire amount and do these extensions, is there something else out there like this waiting for us? You know, are there more? You know, what will this, what would that expenditure imply? So, so. what we can do is go through all petition projects for different types of infrastructure and compile that list and bring it back to the council so you have a total picture of what is out there pending some type of funding and action and that way yeah. you'll be able to make a better informed decision okay that would be great thank you so much thank you mr mayor Are there any further questions if not uh entertain a motion to continue the public hearing until june so 19th it's been proper move a second all in favor of the motion then kept by saying aye all right. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Now, for the persons who are out here, what this means is that the 19th would be the date that we would continue this public hearing and hopefully be able to make a decision. In the interim, the council doesn't meet again as a body until the 18th of June, which is our work session, and we won't be discussing. No, we have work. Don't we have work session the 18th? Because I'm going to ask for excuse meeting. Don't we have a work session the 18th of this month, May? Yeah. That's this Thursday. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I was trying to explain. Okay. I, I was trying to explain to the public uh, what holding the public hearing open until the 19th means. It means that on the 19th of June, we will have this public hearing again to discuss this matter. And hopefully we'll make some kind of decision. No guarantee, but that's, that's the plan. Meanwhile, the council only meets as a body on 18th of June, 18th of May, which is this coming Thursday at a work session, which is open. We probably won't discuss it then because they might not have all the information relevant. The next work session is in June, which will be June the 8th. So in all likelihood, we will probably have a discussion on this matter at our work session on June the 8th at one o'clock on the second floor of the committee room. A discussion doesn't mean we take action because of the problem. And then based on that information, uh, hopefully we'll be in a position June the 19th, which is a regular city council meeting at 7 o'clock, to take some type of action on this. Is, is, is anyone unclear about the process? Okay. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Council Marshall. I'll just add, um, because we continued it to a date certain, there will not be another letter of, you won't get a letter informing you, you guys are here, you know it, pass the word. Thank you. Uh, any other items to come before the council? If not, we're adjourned at 9.43 p.m. Thank Mayor you. Mayor Bell, I'm you sorry. need an excuse absence with the receipt? I'm sheet? sorry, I, I, need ex I, I need an excuse absence. I have to attend the mayor's conference on the 18th. It's been proper to move a second. All in favor of the motion, then kept us saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.